Hi, everyone. This is Raquel. Hi, and this is Jennifer. Welcome to Madness Cafe. This is a feminist podcast where we talk about women's issues, politics, and health and wellness. And where those issues intersect. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Madness Cafe. Today, our guest is the amazing Rachel Kramer Bustle. And let me tell you a little bit about Rachel. She is a New Jersey-based author, editor, blogger, and writing instructor. She has edited over 70, yes, 70 books of erotica, including Crowded House, Threesome, and Group Sex Erotica. It Takes Two, Coming Soon, Women's Orgasm Erotica, and Dirty Dates, Erotic Fantasies for Couples. That's just touching, scratching the surface of all that she has edited. Rachel has also written for AVN, Bust, Cosmopolitan, Curve, The Daily Beast, L.com, and Forbes.com. Again, just scratching the surface. And Rachel has a new book right here. It's called Lap Dance Lust, a collection of erotic stories. Such a great book. We are so excited to talk to Rachel. Rachel, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm excited too. So the way I wanted to start today is a little unusual. You have all those tabs. Yeah, I I like to make notes, but you started the book with an introduction called Pushing My Erotic Boundaries. And interestingly enough, I started reading this book on a trip recently to Boston. And on the way there, I feel like reading the book was pushing my boundaries because I was kind of like, over in the corner, like <laughs> on the plane, hiding, on the plane, <laughs> like hoping no one noticed. But then on the way back, I kind of was like, hey, all hanging out. So it became more the norm for me just over the reading of the stories. Why did you decide to start with, with that introduction? Well, I mean, for me, it's been a little bit of a similar trajectory just over the last 25 years that I've been writing erotica. And I, I fully admit to, I don't really read it in public, at least with, you know, <laughs> cover out because, you know, I've experienced times when people want to talk to me about erotica because they find out what I do. And I don't always want to talk about that, mm-hmm. but I will say, I, I will get to your question, but I will say once I was on a plane and I was reading erotica and I had like a bookmark about it and I wound up talking to this guy about it who was sitting, I think there was a seat empty between us. And we actually had a very interesting conversation. I forget exactly what we discussed, but he was curious about it, but in a respectful way. And I think he kind of wanted to know, like he was, I think I was in my thirties and he was in his fifties and he wanted to know more about erotica for people geared towards people his age. And so it was very interesting. So I think it can actually foster interesting conversations. On the other hand, it could, you know, it could wind up being something kind of creepy. So I would say like for those wanting to read erotica in public, like do so with just, you know, keep in mind that some people might not be as friendly as that guy. But, you know, I think for me, reading and writing erotica have helped me develop a sense of my own sexuality and just have Mm -hmm. helped me kind of figure out what those boundaries are. And also the writing has helped me explore things, some things that I've done, some things that I'm curious about some things that I'm not actually personally interested in doing, but that for whatever reason, like my brain conjured these ideas. So, you know, I I like the idea that this is a bit of a sampler platter of my work and also of different types of sexuality and types of storytelling, because I think that sometimes people think, oh, well, I'm only into, you know, lesbian erotica, or I'm only into spanking erotica, or I'm only into whatever it is. And maybe you are, there's nothing wrong with that. But I also think there's a lot of people who might find themselves turned on by a type of story they don't expect to be. And that's Mm -hmm. why I think short fiction, like in this book and the anthologies I've edited is so great because you, you can pick and choose and you can be exposed to things that you might not seek out consciously, or you might not say, oh, I want a whole book of that. But as part of a larger work you know these are all short like they probably take 10-15 minutes each to read you know I think that 
that also that active reading or listening to audio erotica can can maybe inspire someone in a way that they wouldn't have expected. So for me, writing erotica has helped me kind of explore my own boundaries and also just expose me to a really wide world of sexuality that I wouldn't have necessarily discovered otherwise. Okay, so I have a two-part question. One, what propelled you to start writing erotica? And two, do you do a lot of research beforehand? So um, that, because it, it, I mean, just, I mean, I don't know everything. I know maybe one <laughs> or two things, but it seemed to me like you were very, very thorough. I could see that you were, you were probably pretty spot on with a lot of what you were talking about. Cause you do cover lots of different types of sexuality and sexual relationships and sexual exploration. I'll tackle the first question. Um, okay. <laughs> first. Um, I, I feel like I kind of fell into writing erotica. It was really a result of having been reading erotica, which I discovered when I was in college, you know, visiting a feminist bookstore. And I picked up a book of true lesbian erotic stories. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like, I had read you know, racy books, I guess we could call them, like Daniel Steele, Judith Krantz, but nothing that explicit. And then a few years later, I saw a call for submissions for a book called Starfucker, which was celebrity erotica stories. And I thought, okay, I've been reading these stories. I'm going to try writing one of my own. And I did. It's called Monica and Me. And it's about Monica Lewinsky and a character who's basically Ooh. me. Uh, and so that was my first attempt at writing erotica. And it got published in two different anthologies. And that was just so exciting. Like, wow. it was like, oh, wow, I had this idea and it got picked. And then um, from there, I started writing more. And a lot of those early stories were either based on my life or fantasies that I had. And then to go to your second question, you know, I after a while, I was like, okay, I don't only want to write about my life. And I also, yes, at the time I had a very kind of wild, active, you know, adventurous sex life. There were a lot of stories, but there weren't an infinite number. So I was like, okay, I want to experiment with my writing and write about, you know, gay male erotica and trans erotica and different types of stories. I I have done research online, but it, I would say it's not always about the sex itself like I've done mm -hmm. research about fire eating because I once wrote a story about a fire eaters and I had seen a fire eating performance but I was like I don't really know how they put out the fire in their mouth mm -hmm. without you know burning themselves so it's details like things like that or looking into types of sex toys or things like how can you this isn't in this book but how can you safely start a fire without, you know, like I wanted to write about a woman who wanted to have firefighters come to the house because mm -hmm. she like her fetish, but I didn't want the whole house to burn down because that's too, you know, that's not, that wouldn't serve the erotica purposes. So I wanted a small fire where it was contained enough that she would need the fire department, but not so big that it would you know, be disastrous. So I feel like I've done that kind of research more than sexual research per se, but I, I have tried to make, I mean, most of my stories, unlike authors who might write sci-fi or something, I think mm -hmm. are in the realm of either semi-realistic or realistic or kind of over the top, like um, Secret Service, which is about an oral sex restaurant. I mean, that story even that was one of my favorites in the book, by the way. That one is also one of my favorites. And it's funny because I don't really tend to think of myself as a humorous writer because outside of erotica I write a lot of essays and and even my erotica can be kind of intense I would say not, not serious but intense um mm -hmm. but that humor that one and doing the dishes which is about someone with a dishwashing fetish sort of has just come out through a lot of my erotica and that's been a fun adventure for me because I don't I don't think I set out to say okay I'm gonna write a funny erotica story but it just happened and secret service actually is based on uh, this bar that I did visit Cokie's that used to be in Brooklyn where I um, mean um like people could go in the back and mm -hmm. poke and I was like and and I think like by that point I'd been writing erotica for I don't know however many years my brain just 
and it still this still happens. I will look at a situation like that and think, okay, this is a great setting for an erotica story. And often my stories are just inspired by things like that. Like someone told me, a friend told me about going to Paris and seeing a woman eating French fries with a off a plate with a burner underneath. Mm -hmm. And I, I had to really be picky about what I put in this book because I only had so much space. So this story also didn't make it in, but I wrote a story about a woman who sees that happening and then goes in and then these two women are like feeding each other these French fries in this erotic manner. I, I love a restaurant story and a food story. Those are some of my favorites to write. But I feel like when I hear something like that or if I see a, I don't know, sometimes it's a photo or a phrase or a news story or something like that. There's, I'll hear something and just something goes off in my head and I'm like, oh, I bet I could eroticize that. So that's how a lot of these stories got started. Or sometimes I just will challenge myself like, okay, I've written a lot of stories set in this kind of environment. Can I make a story set in this other type of environment? And another type of story I really like is Hands Down, which is a bondage story, but it's set in a nightclub in New York and the, the bondage is happening under the table and that was really good. Room. So there's this sort of dual thing happening where the two people engaging in the bondage know what's happening, but not every, you know, everyone else doesn't know, but there's this tension of like, are they going to find out? Or are they not going to find out? That's, that's something just a trope that I really enjoy that sort of public semi-private play. You might get caught. Yeah. Even voyeurism. I, I'm, I'm, I like that, you know, I, I think I'm always trying to find ways to approach things like that that are a little bit different. So there's a story called I'll Have What She's Having about a woman who's hired to sit in the window of a restaurant and eat in this really sexy, erotic manner. That and was my other favorite. Fun take on exhibitionism because, you know, it's different than just, than say watching someone through the window, which there's nothing wrong with that either. But I, I just thought that was a really playful way to approach it. And I love anything that can give a little pop culture reference. Yeah, I love that story too. Now mm -hmm. the the title story, Lap Dance Lust, I heard on another podcast you were on that that was a true story. That is a true story. And now that is one of let me see. I don't, I think that, and in the end, well, Belted is, Belted is inspired by a true story, but um, Lap Dance Lust is an entirely true story. And mm. you might think those are easier to write because like it actually happened. I think, I think there's some elements that are easier about that because, you know, I know what happened and I, those I wrote relatively soon after they happened. But I think there's also a, trickier part to it because you know everything that happened like you know what happened beforehand what happened afterward you know all the things we we're feeling and you you know to write a good story this is something I'm always emphasizing to students it's not that you have to put everything in there you have to be judicious about what you do and don't put in so you're weaving out of you know this the the full set of what happened you're weaving the details that make it sensual and exciting and in that one you know I tried to make the pace pretty fast paced because it was a fast paced time you know it was a quick lap dance but it definitely had an impression on me and this this happened over 20 years ago and I mean I still I don't remember every single detail which is another reason I love having written these stories because my just my memory I remember the outline of what happened but having written it down in that way, I can always go back and revisit that story and think about, okay, I know now I, you know, I'll always remember those, those elements of it. And I, I don't think, you know, I, I hesitate sometimes to say that because I think that something that holds people back from writing erotica is they feel like, well, I've only had sex with, you know, my one partner for the last 20 years, or I mm -hmm. have never had a threesome. Can I write an erotica about a threesome? And I think the answer is yes. I mean, you can write about anything, whether you've experienced it or not, because I don't think that just having experienced it makes, means that you can write, you will write automatically an amazing story. I, I think the biggest quality you really need to have to write good erotica is 
imagination and creativity and 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 you know thinking about what aspects of this act whether it's something you did yourself or have done or not are sexy like what makes it sexy to that character if someone else were to write a lap dance story if i were to write another one now it might be totally different but they mo they would both they could both be erotic or you know there could be 20 sexy lap dance stories and they could all be different because we're all different people and there's different elements of it that are sexy and i mean i would imagine maybe a man who goes to strip clubs might write a very different type of story and that story mm -hmm. it's my first time getting a lap dance it's very exciting and a little not scary but like a little like whoa what's going on you know there's there's all kinds of elements and then in my story I think what does make it a little different is that I felt like I got a little bit of more special treatment because I was a woman you know and it, it was I hope I conveyed that it was to me it felt intimate and sort of tender and as well as sexy so you definitely special. conveyed that yeah, yeah it's special, it felt yeah. special to me and you know whether or not it did to the the stripper, I don't know. And I mean, I would love to read more stories by strippers and sex workers and from that perspective too. And I think I've had a really privileged career because I've gotten to write all these stories, but I've also gotten to edit thousands of stories by other people who, from, you know, people from around the world, people of all different genders and sexualities. So I've been exposed to just so many people's perspectives. I mean, a lot of them write sci-fi erotica or things that just I could be sitting at my computer every day for a year and <laughs> I not bet. come up with because that's just not how my mind works. So I, I really love that I've gotten to explore my own fantasies and ideas and also bring out other people's through my editing. Now you get so many stories sent to you. How do you decide what goes in a book? What are the characteristics that you're looking for? It's a mix of a couple things. I'm looking for stories that really grab my attention from the beginning. And, and not, I mean, not all of them are going to do that in the same way. Like some are going to be fast paced the way that lap dance lust is where, you know, something's happening and then another thing, another thing. Some are a bit of a slower build. I'm also looking for, you know, it's hard to say on each individual story as a whole. I'm definitely looking for a variety. I'm looking for different types of characters, different settings. Like I don't want them all set in New York or LA mm -hmm. or, or even all in the US. I want there to be diversity in terms of sexual orientation, gender, uh, race, age, and also things like experience level. I don't want everyone you know, everyone to be a virgin or everyone to be like super slutty for lack of a better word or super experienced. Like, and I also, I, I look for different types of storytelling, like different mm. ways of approaching it, different tenses, different um, points of view. And just, I'm always on the lookout for something that surprises me, especially now, because I've edited over 70 anthologies. I've, that means I've published, I mean, my books have published thousands of stories. So I've read I don't know how many, but probably, you know, many, many thousands. So it's hard to surprise me. But I was going to ask, does anything surprise you anymore? It's hard to surprise me. And it's hard to say, like, I'm looking for this type of thing because I don't know mm. what it is that will surprise me. But people still, right. do, like, authors still surprise me. And and I love that. And I, But I also love stories that seem on the surface, like, straightforward or like, oh, you know, you, maybe you've read you know, this type of story before, but then they write it and just, a, or they they approach it somehow in a way that captures my attention. So yeah, there, there's no like single thing. Like sometimes people will say to me, okay, like your deadline's almost here. And like, is there anything you're missing that you want people to write about? And it's hard because I don't always think about it that way. I, I'm more just, I read every story that comes in and then I make the selections based on that. And then sometimes I will get close. Like I need 20 stories and I have 18 and I'm looking for two more that maybe have some element like bondage in it or something that I don't have already. But usually it's more just sort of a, a feeling of, okay, this appeals to me and, and I can't always, you know, articulate it. I, I also, I like stories that 
not not that I would want every story to do this, but that play on things happening in the real world. Um, the author Sabrina Soul wrote a story called At the Pleasure of the President, and it was about uh, the first Latina U.S. president and her lover and there were also other like political things happening and so like there was a little bit of a feminist message but but it didn't it didn't do that at the expense of the eroticism it was still mm. a very sexy story so I like stories that play on pop culture or have a maybe a little bit of a message in some way but with but always with the erotic part being first and foremost well since you brought up the feminism do you think eroticism and feminist feminism go together or do you think they fight each other? I think they can go. I don't think they fight each other. I think they can go together, but they don't necessarily have to. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think there's an element of feminism in women pursuing the things that turn them on. Right. But like, would I say that these stories are feminist erotica per se, like the ones I've written, not necessarily, you know, so I, I think they're related, but it's sort of a tricky thing because I, I don't, I wouldn't want to have to say, oh, okay, like, is this feminist sex and this isn't feminist sex? Cause where, where do you draw the line? Right. Exactly. Like, who, who decides? Yeah. But I do think that women writing more erotica and being open about it or or not necessarily open because not everyone you know I, there's some authors who've written for me who no one in their life knows that they write it like in their personal life because mm -hmm. there's there is still stigma around it you know there's still people who feel like and not just feel like they would be judged by their neighbors their friends their partners their jobs you know if mm -hmm. people do um which is sort of I feel like that that is sort of paradoxical and frustrating and the fact that now you know after sex in the city and we, we've had all these cultural pushes to make sexuality more open especially for women but there is still that element and and not you know it that doesn't just affect women I've had male authors tell me you know I can't like a page on Facebook for your book that I'm in or for your event or whatever because someone might see that and then judge oh, wow. For that so I think that that shame and stigma is I think it's probably you know I, it's problematic and I think it I think it inhibits people not just in what they do but in what they think about like they they feel like oh I have this fantasy well that means this about me and that means people are going to think this about me and I think it I think it really gets into people's heads and especially if they grew up in a shame well in a shame-based um culture or mm -hmm. purity it's culture it's yeah. hard to get rid of that you know it's even even when you think you have I think it, and, and I think people especially if they might be judged by a partner or or if they reveal something that they're curious about and I think those those things can be really damaging mm -hmm. and so I think whether or not this is feminist or not I think just the writing of erotica and erotica being more out there and accepted. I mean, I definitely think it's more accepted now than it was 25 years ago when I started. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing for everyone because right. I think it opens up more dialogue and it, and it, I think just sometimes just people knowing that it exists helps them feel more comfortable around their own desires, whatever those desires are. So that actually dovetails into what, <clears throat> excuse me, what I wanted to ask about was what are some of the biggest misconceptions about erotica and about women writing erotica? I mean, I think one of the biggest is that if you like a certain type of erotica, then that means that you're into that thing in real life. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think that that sometimes keeps people from exploring certain genres or, or or if they do you know they feel maybe uncomfortable around it or they question what that means like I don't think it has to have a deeper meaning if, if you watch murder mysteries or read thrillers or whatever or serial killer thrillers it doesn't mean that you are a serial killer or want right. to be a serial killer but we don't assume that about people reading those kinds of genres but Good I think we still do often around erotica. So I think that's one um, misconception. And I think especially 
with women and erotica, I think there is still this this idea, A, that if you're writing about something, you've either done it or you want to do it or that you're slutty or you're, mm -hmm. that I think those, that kind of slut shaming still happens. Yes, and, it does. And I think that that's a way of trying to keep women's sexuality sort of, contain, not sort of contained, contained, you know, mm -hmm. I think that people might say, oh, well, that's okay for someone else, but you know, I, I think even now, 2024, there are certainly some men and probably some women who like, they wouldn't want their female partner necessarily writing erotica, which I think is kind of, first of all, ridiculous because it's, it's not, I, I, there's nothing I, to be ashamed about, you know, and I think it's, it's a creative expression, you know, and it's, it's, I think also, now, this is not the case for everyone, but I think for a lot of people, certainly I can say for myself, writing erotica, I think has made me a better lover, um, just in the broader sense, because it's exposed me to so many types of sexuality. And it's, I think it's made me more open-minded mm. about people's desires. And, and I think beyond just being a better lover, I think it's also made me just a better person, like a more open-minded person and accepting person like I don't have to necessarily understand someone else's fetish or kink to to support the fact that they have it and that they should be able to you know find someone who shares that of course this all being consensual mm -hmm. you know, of course find someone who and I think that sometimes we we I think there is this assumption, assumption that it's only women who are hampered by these ideas and I think it's it's everyone who's hampered by, by these ideas. Like there are certainly men who want to be submissive or who are submissive, but who don't feel like that's a, an okay thing to share with a partner because our culture still tells us like straight men, especially are supposed to be, you know, macho and manly. And, and I think that there, you know, I don't know how much progress we've really made around, around that in our culture. Like, I think there's still a lot of people who think that, okay, this much experimentation is okay. Like maybe it's okay to be a woman getting a lap dance, but, uh, you know, a man being bi-curious or mm -hmm. a man being submissive or, you know, I, I think there's still a lot of things that we have a ways to go in terms of, of openness. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. When I talk to my coach today about this interview tonight. And I talked to my boyfriend about this interview tonight. And I told both of them that after reading your book and listening to podcasts, I thought, hmm, maybe I should try writing some erotica. And both of them were very supportive for two kind of different reasons. And my coach was kind of like, this would be a really good exercise in just kind of exploring your creativity. My boyfriend was like, this would be a really good thing to do to explore what it is that you actually want. Like if you, me, if I allowed myself to just go wherever in my mind sexually and be like, oh, what is it I like? And weird, I'm 55. I've never really done that. And I thought, I think, I mean, I think both of those are are true, you know, and I, and I think I've something I've discovered is that often I will sit down to write erotica and what comes out is not something I ever would have thought that I was going to write or I didn't consciously intend to go in that direction and you know these are all stories under my name but I've written erotica under a pseudonym a few times because there were just some things that I I didn't necessarily want to put under my name and, and so I think that sometimes people have that initial impulse to write erotica, but then they sort of scare themselves out of it because mm. they think, well, what if, what if my partner reads it and then they think this, or what if, what if, you know, I think they even maybe it, it, it shocks themselves. And I think that to be creative in any format, like with writing or art or music or anything else, like, I think you have to kind of, for at least the time, a short time period when you're doing the art get rid of those, that inner critic and just see what happens. And then you can decide, okay, do I want to show this to anyone? Do I want to 
delete it or or just save it in a file that's marked like something that no one would ever open, you know, taxes. I, I think that <laughs> you really do justice to your creativity. You have to just be doing it for yourself first and, and not thinking about what the next steps are, because it, that can be so detrimental to being truly open to exploring those things. I mean, another thing about erotica, especially is that it's so personal. I think that's why, you know, people will have very strong reactions, like they either love it or hate it, often because of, you know, it touches on something that either squicks them, like freaks them out, or or just is is something that turns them on. And I don't think- Or, there's or a right little of both. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't, and I don't think, you know, like, I would never say, oh, well, like, you can't appreciate good writing because you don't like this. I don't think it's even about, uh, you know, good or bad writing. I mean, I think that there's certain techniques you can use to amp up the erotic tension in your stories. But I think that people react to erotica for such visceral and personal and intimate reasons. And they don't always, you know, you don't always know why. But like, I also, like I said earlier, you know, like doing the dishes, the my dishwashing fetish story, that is partly inspired by, I actually love doing dishes, not in an erotic way, but I, I really do enjoy doing dishes. So I wanted to kind of push that and see, okay, what if this character loves doing this just so much, it becomes part of foreplay. So, and I also think that once you start writing erotica, or at least thinking about it, you will find those kind of scenarios where something that might otherwise seem totally ordinary becomes a chance to, you know, explore erotica. Like maybe there's a fire drill at your office and everyone has to go outside and then two people sneak off, like two people who never see each other because they work in different parts of the building or whatever, suddenly catch each other's eye or, or who knows what, you know, I, I yeah. think that there's so many everyday situations that we might overlook because they're kind of boring and, you know, but, but when you look at them through an erotic lens, you're like, wait, could I turn this into an erotica story? And I'm, I'm often trying to challenge myself, like, okay, especially, and it's, it can be kind of a fun way to take something that's annoying, like, okay, you have to wait extra time at the post office, or there's a traffic jam, or there's a detour, or there's something, you can say, okay, well, in real life, this sucks, but what if I was in an erotica story, and <laughs> the character was like, well, this sucks, but I'm gonna take it and, you know, do something wild and sexy with it. <laughs> That's yeah. yeah, that's pretty interesting. I mean, that's kind of I sense a theme here, sort of, Jennifer, with like things that we've been talking about lately of getting more in touch with your own sensuality, mm -hmm. right? And allowing it to not just allowing it to come through, but even acknowledging that it's there. That's exactly what I was going to say before, I think that we so often think of our sexuality and sexuality in general as being about what we do with someone else or how we mm -hmm. interact with someone else. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's part of it for a lot of people, but I think a lot of it is in our, in our minds and in our, just it's more personal than that, you know, and, and maybe we share that intimate personal part with someone else, but even if you are in a relationship, you might also have your own things that are just for you that you you don't have to share every thought with your partner and that's not like I'm not saying you know what I'm saying I mean I I, I I'm, it's not, I'm not saying like cheat on them or do something that they wouldn't approve of but you're entitled to your own fantasy life and what that those fantasies consist of is it's up to you I mean and and sometimes those fantasies we don't know where they come from and we don't have to know. Like, I don't, I don't think we always have to answer to the fantasy. And I think that's what I was saying before about exploring your desires through erotica. You know, you might not know what, why you're suddenly like, oh, I want to write about 1950s pinups or I want to write about, I don't know, bodybuilders or whatever. Like, you don't, it, it might not be something that you, are actively interested in in your everyday life it might just be something that comes from wherever you know our creative impulses come from yeah, yeah. like imagination like you like said. play and fun mm -hmm. and maybe you really don't want to do that it's just fun to think about it 
Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that that's another reason why sometimes I've used a pseudonym just to get out of my own head and like, just to sort of, it's almost like acting or role playing, like mm -hmm. not, I, you know, I don't necessarily always want to be in my head. Sometimes I want to be in someone else's head. And so like that sometimes helped me get into the character's mind, uh, who's a little bit different for me. One of the exercises I give my students, um, and I do have another book, uh, How to Write Erotica, which is a craft guide for anyone looking for inspiration, is to write about a character who's different from you. The difference could be something like you live, you've always lived in the city and they're like, they live in the country. It might be that you're an extrovert and they're very shy and they're an introvert. Um, it could be a character who's a different gender or different sexual orientation or different age than you or, or any kind of difference. Like, I, I think that can be a really good exercise, especially if you've written a lot based on your own experience. It can be a fun and certainly illuminating experience to say, okay, I'm going to write about someone who on one or more levels is different than me, but they might also share things with you, right? Like they might be a different gender, but you both might be into dirty talk or they might be shy, but they might be into hot wax play or whatever it is. It's just like in real life where you might have lots of things in common with someone and then also things you don't have in common with mm -hmm. them. Like you don't have to be exactly like your characters and you might share things with your characters. And that's to me, like the, the thrill of writing fiction, which, you know, I also write nonfiction where you are more constrained, like you have to stick to the facts and there's something exciting about that too. But I think fiction gives you so much freedom to sort of pick and choose. Like it could be your clothes on a different character or your fetish on a character who has a totally different personality than you and like what winds up being recognizable from your life and what isn't. And, and you know, it might only be recognizable to you. And then because it's fiction, when, and like a lot of most erotica writers are not even publishing under their real name. So no one has to know, but even if they did like that, that's another part that can be totally personal, personal to you. So, you know, you might write something that is your literal fantasy, but if you show it to someone, you don't have to say, this is my fantasy. What do you think about it? You can say, <laughs> I wrote this totally fictional story, you know, <laughs> you might like it. On page 110, one of your characters says, I never want to engage in bondage with an unwilling participant. How important is consent in your writing? In my writing, it's very, very important. Like, I don't want to, I, I would feel irresponsible to have people doing things to other characters without their consent. I mean, that being said, it's not, I mean, I hope it's clear in all the stories. I don't always have everyone say, you know, explicitly like, please, you know, I, the word consent doesn't appear in every story, but I hope the acts are conveyed. That is really important to me because I would feel unethical doing it otherwise. And I also think as a reader, it would take me out of the story and pause the eroticism for me if I felt like characters were not consenting. Um, you know, sometimes I I give authors the benefit of the doubt when it comes to things like there was a story I published where it was set in a bakery and there were characters having sexual play with each other while other employees were there. Now, some people felt like that was not consensual on the part of the other employees, like they were kind of being forced to watch the people. I felt like as part of the tone of the story, it was clear to me that they were into it. And, mm. and, and, you know, I, I did make sure I thought I had made sure that that was explicit. And, you know, I think that in that case, you know, some things like that, you know, people are going to interpret different things differently. Sure. Um, but I definitely do my best to make it clear that everything is consensual. And I, and I think, you know, sometimes there are, you know, elements of playfulness and fantasy that, make their way into the story where, you know, you know, that it's not really happening. Like, I don't think there could ever really be an oral sex restaurant. You know, I just don't think just logistically, just like, we're not, <laughs> not going to have that. Maybe a, a party 
you that know, might be my party. business venture. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I mean, and just to be clear, like the cocaine bar was not a legal. I mean, the bar was probably legal, but what was happening in the back was not like right. really yeah. sanctioned. But I mean, it did happen. So, uh, so like that was a story where it's playful. But even within that environment, where it's this obviously over the top fantasy, you know, I, I I did try to make it as realistic in the sense that you know I'm sure that if there was an oral sex restaurant, there would be patrons who would happily go there. So, mm -hmm. so I mm -hmm. you know sometimes it's a tricky balance to get that tone of like fun and sexiness while also making it you know, clear that there is consent, but I, I think you can do it in a way that doesn't detract from the, the eroticism. And I think you can even make it part of like a character's dirty talk or, or foreplay to kind of get that across that, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, someone can sort of make the other person say, I, I want to hear you say, I want you to do this to me. Yeah. yeah. And also I think putting where the situations were using like some slapping or some choking and stuff like that you in your stories there seemed to always be a safe word or some kind of agreement that was made ahead of time yeah and I mean I think that's another thing that you know I was saying before that erotica is so personal I think there's certain acts that are sexual to some people that are never going to be sexual to other people and I totally mm -hmm. understand that um and when I write about something like face slapping, which is, there's a story called the slap in the face. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very careful to make it clear that both the person doing the slapping and receiving it are wanting it from that other person. And that, you know, that it's part of their interplay and that, that, you know, they're each getting something out of it. Um, and, and that can be, that can be especially hard actually for the person doing the slapping or doing the mm -hmm. thing or choking, because, I think it can, they can appear if you don't do it well, like a villain or like someone who's just, you know, sadistic in a non-sexual way, you know, mm -hmm. like just trying to hurt someone else. But I think that you have, I, I think that is a situation where you do have to have an understanding of the dynamics of BDSM to understand why someone would want to have that happen to them and then why their partner would want to give that to them. Again, I don't think you have to have done these things yourself personally, but I think if you haven't, then you do have to try to do some research into why people are in real life are into these things so you can convey it in fiction. Because otherwise I, it can be, you know, it can come across as problematic. And I, and I think mm -hmm. there's, there's going to be people who are not going to necessarily understand a fetish like being spanked with a belt that is in this book too or or role playing or choking or whatever and then it, I I feel like it's my job as an erotica author to you know I'm, I'm not trying to speak for everyone who has a specific fetish I'm trying to convey what's happening with one or two specific characters and how it works in their you know relationship yeah I think that came across mm -hmm. for sure yeah, one thing that I really appreciate with the the different stories in the book, especially the one um a first time for everything, mm -hmm. is that it was pretty clear that the that the people involved were making these decisions for themselves, right? They weren't being forced to do anything and they didn't um they weren't making these decisions because they were being pressured by somebody else, right? Like there were, I mean, the, the people in, in your stories are, they're owning their sexuality, they're owning their sensuality, they're owning their, their play yeah. and their imagination and their creativity in, in, all the ways that they can explore all of that and yeah. that that I thought was was really great like I appreciated that quite a bit yeah and I mean there's definitely stories in here that are pretty daring I mean there's people who want to be in a you know boxing ring getting punched there's people who want to have 
a woman who wants to have a lot of men, you know, come on them at a party, but she's organizing the party. I mean, I think, yeah. I think that that's, you know, I hope that what comes across is that these are all things that people want to have happening, um, you know, and, and also, you know, and I do want to get in that there are, there's some of these playful, funny stories. There's also some very emotionally intense stories. There's the end, which is a breakup erotica story, which oh, I would never heart. like publish a whole book of that because I just think like, people would be like too sad. But you know, that is probably that might be my most personal story. That's a really hard story, but one in really, you know, that came from a very emotional time in my life. Mm-hmm. But I was so glad to get to express that. I mean, in a very different way, I, I was glad I wrote that similar to how I was glad I wrote Lap Dance Less. I could never go back 20 years later and recreate that story, like mm-hmm. from, because it's just something that poured out of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a story at the end, Standing Room Only, about a widow who's exploring her sexuality. It's my favorite story. And that was that one and Caught in the Act are new stories that I wrote specifically for this book. Yeah. Um, that's again where I feel like I tried hard to pick stories that run the gamut from funny to maybe are going to make you cry. And, you know, I don't think, I mean, that's not like a selling point. I'm not like, read this book because it's going to make you cry. But <laughs> you know, people have told me that the end has you know, made them tear up and that that mm-hmm. is moving in a different way for me. Mm-hmm. The reason I love that story is not, it didn't make me want to cry at all. It's called Standing Room Only. And the character says she came there looking for a sexual rebirth. And that part to me was like, uh, it's like we can have these different times in our lives. And, and yes, it is sad that she was widowed, but at the same point, she didn't just curl up and die. She Mm -hmm. is still a woman. She still has her own sexuality. She still wants to experience life and she's living it. I thought it was a fantastic story. Mm -hmm. I thought it. And, you know, I think that's something else that is important to remember just in erotica in general. I think there's this impulse to write about, there's often I mean, the vast majority of the stories I receive when I'm editing anthologies are people who are getting together for the first time. You know, they're either they they just have just met and they're, you know, the story is unfolding and their first sexual encounter, or it's the early stages, or it's just kind of new. And and so of course there's drama and tension around that. And and I totally understand that. I mean, that's that makes sense that that's our inclination to write about that like first chemistry. But I'm First of all, I'm 48. Second of all, I've been in a relationship for 12 and a half years. Like I'm very interested in after that, whether it's the widow. So like after that long-term relationship or in the midst of a long-term relationship. And I'm interested in characters who are parents and trying to navigate having a personal, sexual, intimate life along with the 24 seven, you know, ness of raising kids and, and how that affects their partnership. You know, I'm interested in how real life, which is not always, you know, going to be erotic intersects with (laughs) sex. And, you know, I, I think that sometimes we assume, oh, well, it's erotica. So it should all be escapism. And I think you can have the escapism of the, the sexy parts mixed in with these real life elements, because that's how sex works in the real world like we don't only have desire when our life is going perfectly I think it's a very primal thing to want to connect with someone on that personal intimate level I was going to say romantic but it doesn't necessarily have to be romantic when things are going terribly too and I think it's different it's different than when you're falling in love or lust or there's a different aspect of desiring someone when you know you're in the middle of a pandemic or you're going through a divorce or you're you just received really bad news but we still desire like we still have that not not everyone and not all the time but I think it's I think it's to erotica's credit that it can encompass all those things you know all 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 aspects of life not just the like amazing parts of it that's fantastic 
I was going to ask you what you wanted people to take away from reading your work and you just basically said it. So, I mean, like when I teach, I always say erotica's first job, you know, primary job is to arouse readers. So yes, I hope they are turned on, but I also hope like, especially with lap dance, less the book that they're that it makes them think like like about sex in maybe a new way or just, you know, makes them, you know, consider something they hadn't considered before, whether that's something like a, a fetish, like a, you know, the dishwashing or face slapping or, or, you know, just an open relationships and just to sort of look around the world and, and realize that sex is about is certainly about more than just our own desires like even if we're very even if we have a wide range of desires there's still a wider world of sex out there which I mean this just touches the surface but you know I think that that going back to what I said earlier about it making me feel like I think I'm a better person I think we'd all be more um empathetic people if we recognize that there's people who get off on things that we might never understand, but we can still keep space for that. Mainly, I hope it turns them on and entertains them, but I do, you know, if, if I can get one more thing, I hope it makes them sort of just realize that there's so many ways that we have sexual desire and so many ways that that can be performed. Well, I, I have to say that I, like when we, when we first got the book I was a little nervous because you know I have my prudish side you know but and it's it's <laughs> I know I'm a dork and you know I've not read a lot of erotica I mean I read a little bit teeny tiny little bit but I've never sat and read an entire book of erotica I mean I've just I've not and I I really enjoyed this book not just because it's arousing I mean because it is there's a lot of sexiness in the book it's really good but you are such a good storyteller mm. and you write so well and you write from so many like different points of view and so in so many different voices that I really just want to say kudos to you because you are incredibly talented and this book, for one, I think, showcases that. For nothing else, people should read the book because you're incredibly talented and they should read your work. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It's just, yeah, yeah, it was, it's just, it's a, it's a, a very enjoyable read and not just because um, there's a lot of sexy time. And if I can just say one more thing about that, like, you don't have to read them in order. Like, you can, you can, like, you know, pick and choose and, you know, jump around. You're like, ooh, sexathon, what's that? You know, you can jump right to that. They're all relatively short because I know we're all pressed for time. So, I mean, you can, by all means, you can spend all night reading the whole thing all at once. But I think they're also great stories to read if you have a partner, you know, alongside a partner or just, you know, jump around. But I, th I think there's something, maybe not for everyone, but for a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I thoroughly agree. And I think there's something for people in all phases of their lives. I don't know. I think maybe I had this sort of misconception that all erotica was about young, fit, beautiful people. But no, I mean, older people still have sex. Widows have sex again people who've been in relationships for 10, 12, whatever years. So yeah. So I just, I don't know. I, I thought it was, I thought it's, it's, it's a really good book. And um, yeah, I may be revisiting many stories in the book many times. <laughs> That's awesome. Did you have anything else you wanted to say to our audience before we say goodbye? I do just want to say it's available in print and ebook. And there, for those who listen to audio, there will be an audio book. So, oh, just, I may have to download that as soon as it's available. I know that, that a lot of people really prefer to listen. Either they don't want to have like a physical book in the house or they're just, I think, I think that's a, in, in many ways a different experience. Like it adds a layer of eroticism just from the listening. So yeah, I just wanted to let people know that. Are you reading the audiobook or is someone else reading it? Someone else will be reading it. 
Nice. Very nice. Well, it was really awesome to meet you. Thanks for being on the show. And thanks for exposing us to something that neither one of us had a whole lot of experience with. Yes. Thank you for this great conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Okay. I have to say there literally is something in here for people for like multiple stages in their lives. Like, the story, the end, I think really, really, really touched me. Which one was the end? That that was the one where um they were they were having sex for the last time before they broke up. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I've been in that situation where I knew this was the last time. Mm -hmm. Either because I was getting ready to leave. Or so you got one more before you said goodbye uh -huh, uh -huh. or more often than not, I had just been broken up with and I was like, okay, but how about one more for the road? And then I end up like just feeling like a total heel and like crying my eyes out. There's emotion in it. And maybe that's the difference of, maybe that's one of the misconceptions that I had that, that there wasn't emotion in erotica, that it was all just like, you know, Smut. do do your thing get your rocks off and then wham bam thank you ma'am see you later you know what i mean like but yeah but no, that's a this very narrow view of it yeah this is yeah. definitely storytelling yeah. for sure okay where my misconception came from i've read i don't know if you'd call it erotica i don't know where the lines blur but i mm -hmm. read 50 shades of gray mm -hmm. and i also read those vampire stories what were they called oh um not twilight yeah, Twilight. Okay. okay. So I read both of those because my daughter wanted to read them and mm -hmm. I wanted, didn't work out this way, but this was my fantasy. I wanted to read them along with her so we could discuss ah. certain aspects of the book. I thought Fifty Shades of Grey sucked, people. I thought the <laughs> writing- I've heard that. I've heard I that. I thought the people. writing was so bad. It was I've so heard that bad. so many people. So my- preconception or misconception of erotica would be that it would that, that the writing would be bad that it wouldn't be entertaining that it wouldn't be well done mm -hmm. and I have to say for anyone interested in reading that this book is very well written very the writing is good it's entertaining it's like you said full of emotion the stories are good the first three I read like on the airplane <laughs> like this but by the end, I was hanging out, reading my book, no <laughs> shame. And the woman next to me was snoring. She couldn't have cared less anyway, right, right, right on the airplane. The other thing that I really have to confront within my own self is still that well-run, well-made groove in my head of purity culture ah, mm -hmm, of like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. You don't want to be reading about sex. Oh, it's smut. It's oh, it's nasty. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't find it nasty at all. Did you find it nasty? No, God, no. No. In fact, I felt like this was a really accessible way. And I think Rachel even said this earlier. This is a really accessible way to explore and to learn things. Yeah. I learned a I learned a lot. Same. Same. I learned a lot read this book and I, and now I'm like uh yeah I think I need to broaden my genre of reading because I need I think I need to read some more erotica I posted a picture on Facebook and said it was my first time reading erotica and one of my friends was like you been messing <laughs> up girl <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> I'm like okay I get it <laughs> Yeah, better yeah. late than never. It's fine. <laughs> right. What you been doing all these years? <laughs> no, I love, I love, I, I really enjoyed reading this book. I yeah. didn't think I was going to. I did. I would recommend it to anyone yeah. because I think it's very well written. Very well written. And there's sex in it. And mm -hmm. I enjoyed reading about the sex. I also think it would be a really interesting exercise for anyone to sit down with pen and paper and see and just not thinking anyone's going to read it, just like writing it. And like, what would I write if I was going to write? I think I'm going to mm. do that. I think I'm going to mm. write an erotica story. I think you should. You know what I'm going to do? 
What? I'm going to write a story about Matthew and I going to that. Matthew's my boyfriend about us going to the jury conference where we met. And instead of us doing what we did and not get together, I'm going to pretend like we meet at the conference and we have sex there and write a story about what could have happened. Wouldn't that be fun? I think you should totally do that. You yeah. Should do it. Yeah. Yeah. Like we break all the rules of the conference and he sneaks into my dorm see it's already I'm yeah already it's already in the brain sneaking into go. the dorm room on the single bed there with the go. bed knocking against the wall oh, hoping just our like neighbor, college except I didn't live in the dorm rooms I never had that experience oh yes I'm gonna write the, the 54 year old's version of the college <laughs> dorm room fuck experience <laughs> I love it I love it I love it you know and okay so this is another misconception that I think that I had about no not I don't think I had it I totally had it I had the misconception that erotica was just like I said it was just basic no character development it literally was just here's a sex scene done okay on to the next story here's a sex scene on to the you know but no these these stories and these characters are fully fully developed they're people they, they are people and that takes to be able to do that in short story form is so good it's so it's creative good. it's good writing mm -hmm. absolutely so yes yeah. yeah. so and people... and editing mm -hmm. and editing yeah and so yeah. yeah people pick this book up lap dance lust by Rachel Kramer Bustle. So good. Bye, Rachel. <laughs> Bye, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone, for listening today. We will be back with more Madness Cafe next week. You can find us on Instagram at Madness Cafe Podcast or email us at madnesscafepodcast at gmail.com. Bye.